So I've talked a little bit before, um, a little bit about my biological father. And I, it was two years ago that I truly met him for the first time and really got to know him in person. And before that, I remember as a child, as a little kid, I was raised in this. And as a, since a toddler, praying for the Holy Ghost, I would just be there at conferences or services. And I would just imagine just my, my biological dad laying his hand on me and, and just praying for me to receive the Holy Ghost. I knew that if he just touched me, um, that I would receive the Holy Ghost. And I would have some men who would pray for me thinking that, wow, that maybe this is the day, maybe this is him. Um, there were times where um, even at uh, football games where I was playing and I, was, I would always look at the stands and be like, man, you know, so, so one day he said, you know, I'll be there. One, one day I'll make it, I'll be there. And so I'd, I would always imagine that it would be a surprise that he was there. And so that's where a lot of my motivation came from. Um, at a big conference when I was 17, um, this is where God really got a hold of me and changed my life. And I can say that as much as my dad was my dad, my biological dad, it was God who became my dad when I was praying as a child. And it was God who was there when I was alone. It was God who became my dad when he called me at 17 and gave me a purpose through every trial. And I want to tell you that I've been praying. I've been praying, God, I, I, want to, I want to know what it's like to be a son. I need you to teach me how to be a son. And I genuinely have been praying that for the longest time. And God has told me recently, he's like, Chris, you, you need to learn first who I am as a father. You need to change your perspective of who I am as a father, of who I am as a dad, of who I am as your dad. And I'm like, okay, teach me. And I want to tell you that he loves you more than you know. And I want to go to Matthew 6, 25. It says, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Just think about your dad talking to you right now, your spiritual dad, God. And it says, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store foods in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. I remember when I met my dad for the first time, that we went to the store, and I've talked about it before, holding one of the, the, the sweaters that he gave me that was really expensive. And he, I would just walk around with him. He was just like, Chris, whatever you want. You like this? You want that? You want this? I've got you. I've got you. Don't worry about it. I've got you. It's expensive, though. Are you serious? I'm looking at the tag. He's like, I've got you. Don't worry about it. So I can tell you in, in the next, in chapter 7, it says, it, it talks about that. If, if we who are evil, if, you, if the earthly, if your earthly really, if your earthly father, us, are willing to give gifts and willing to give you things, how much more is your heavenly father willing to do that for you? So that's why I can tell you today, if you came anxious and you've been worried, and you've been having a lot of weight on you, and you're beginning to run out of faith, that it's his perfect love that casts out fear. Because God taught me, Chris, that this is how you become my, this is how you learn how to become a son, by knowing my love for you. And if you know that I love you more than anything, the Bible says that, that, that it's talking about um, that he, um, sorry, my mind is, um, but it's talking about that, yeah, um, Sorry, sorry. Just drawing a blank here, but um, yeah. But I'm telling you, if you will understand his love for you, that he died for you, if he is willing to give up your life, it talks about as a friend, would give up, you know, 
Um, but I can tell you that he, he got, it was God who was the one who died for me. It wasn't my biolog biological dad. It was him who died for me. It was him who was there when I was a child praying and he came up to me. It was, there, it was him who filled me with the Holy Ghost. It was him when I was alone. And it's through the power of the blood that we just saying, through the death, burial, and resurrection, all wrapped up in the name of Jesus. And this is the verse that because no greater love hath a man than to lay his life down for his friends. And that's what he, that's what he did for you in Jesus' name. House of God today? Yeah. Amen. It's great to see all of you. And just a warning to Chris, it doesn't get any better. <laughs> Hallelujah. Would you mind standing with me as we go to the book of John, chapter 21? Hallelujah. Chapter 21, verse... Three. Beginning at three. Man, I like hearing all those pages shuffling. Some of you young people are going to bring the phone and, it's, and, and turn on the audio and it'll, it'll say pages shuffling. I saw a couple of them. Hey, that's a good idea. John chapter 21, verse 3. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. <clears throat> they went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. So, in, introduc in the introduction, when I read this scripture, first of all, according to everything that was happening, <laughs> Peter said, you know what, guys? I think I'm going fishing. And sometimes when circumstances become tight when confusion comes when pressure comes there's a tendency sometimes to revert back to where you came from it's what we're comfortable with so he said I'm going fishing but he didn't just go alone he yeah he, six other ones said yeah it sounds like a great idea let's go now the fact that Jesus came to them it says that he stood on the shore. Logic says, well, you know, it could be a long ways, and the fact that they didn't recognize who he was wouldn't really be that big of a deal. But it says for, there, there are two major points <coughs> before you get seated. Is, first of all, it was only 100 yards away. With a crossbow, I can shoot a deer at 100 yards. But the second piece is, this is the last chapter of John. This isn't the first chapter where they didn't recognize him. They didn't really know for sure. This is after they walked with him for three and a half years. After they listened to him. After they watched him work his way down the dusty streets of Jerusalem. And did all these miracles called people out of graves and raise the dead and heal the sick and this is after watching so if you hang around somebody for three and a half years and they're standing a hundred yards away you're like yeah it looks kind of familiar I think I know who that is but it says they didn't know it was him I want to talk to us this morning on familiar from a distance familiar from a distance. Lord, I pray that you'd let your word once again yes. talk to us. Draw again. Help us to take our spiritual pails and drop them into the well of wisdom of your word, I pray, and help us to draw from that. Learn more about you, God. 
teach us some more principles, God, some things that may apply to our lives. We pray for this, God, in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. Man, you guys pray a lot. Yep, sure do. The reason we pray is because we know he listens to our prayer. And Brother Yance always taught that nothing of any standing value happens without prayer. So if we pray 14 times by the time you walk in the door to the time you leave, uh, we are simply trying to achieve the will of God. But we look at this and we think, a hundred yards away, and they didn't recognize him. What happened? I mean, uh, what happened, Jesus? How did they not recognize you? In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 22, it says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not, have we not done a bunch of things? Have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. This is a statement that Jesus was making, and he said, you guys were doing the right things, and you were going through the actions. You lifted your hands the right way. You dressed the right way. You, you were in the right place at the right time. You, you learned the old... <clears throat> Pentecostal cliches and you were trying to respond methodically to what you knew was right but there was no relationship there right. you had no relationship with me and he was saying after all these things that they did he said depart from me you that work iniquity when I first came in the church, I always thought that word, you know, they, they, when I read that scripture, I always thought, you know, they were, they were doing the things Pentecostally, but they were living in sin. That's what I thought. But really, it was, but it was a different kind. They were involved in the things of God, but they were doing things their own way. That's what iniquity is. Wow. It's, yeah. it's doing things according to your will and not his. Right. So that's what iniquity is, doing it my way. I have a better idea than God. And God said, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways above your ways and my thoughts above your thoughts. His ways are so much higher than ours and his thoughts. I've been praying lately, God, I want your thoughts because my thoughts don't seem to get the job done. My ways seem to have a little bit of fruit, but nowhere near as much as we need. So God, help me to figure out what your way is. Let me latch on to the flow of the Spirit because that's what your way is. And so he's talking about, he's talking about doing things their own way. But he said, I don't know you. <clears throat> and in Matthew 25, 11, this was the story of the ten virgins that came and they all had lamps and they were all lit. And they were all there at the right time. <clears throat> but after a short while, five of their lamps went out. And they had to go get oil. And when they went, the door opened. And five were allowed in and five were not allowed in. And afterward came also the other virgins, the five. And they said, Lord, notice they got it right. Lord, they didn't say, hey, prophet. They didn't say, hey, man of God. They said, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he answered and said, verily I say unto you, I know you not. There's no relationship. So obviously, we have a problem with relationship. Even though people were in the presence of the bridegroom, even though they were in the presence of the Lord, they were casting out demons and healing the sick and doing everything, quote, right, there was no relationship with God. So we have to be careful not to associate relationship with things that we do, but also don't associate uh, things that we do with a relationship. We have to make sure that 
We say, well, I just love God, but I'm never going to do anything. It has to come together. Faith without works is dead. So I believe in God, but I'm going to prove my works, like he said, like James said, by my works. What I do will prove to you that I know him. It will prove to you that I have faith in him. It will prove to you that I got things that he wants me to do, and I'm listening to him, and I'm doing this his way. So I need to have faith, but I also need to operate in faith by the fruit that comes out of my life. I need to prove. It says, you know, you know them by their fruit. So laying the fact that there needs to be a relationship with God on the fact that they didn't know after 21 chapters, after three and a half years, they didn't recognize him. I want to talk about that. In John chapter 21 verse 5 as we as we continue the story the Bible says then Jesus saith unto them children have ye any meat remember the fact that they were not familiar I like that never never forget we're not supposed to forget what he did we're not we're also not supposed to forget who he is we're not supposed to forget what he sounds like, what he looks like, how he responds, how he, re- how he moves, how he acts in the midst of people. We're supposed to get familiar with him. And, and, and that is what God spoke to me. If you're fairly new in the church, let me encourage you today. Um, it's important that we learn his voice. It's important that we learn who he is. The best way that, that, that God told me to learn who he is is I started reading in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And when I read the Gospels, I said, Lord, the best way that I can figure out who you are is not for somebody to tell me about you, but it's to read in your word. And I want to read every word that you spoke. I want to watch where you went. I want to see how you responded. I want to see where you didn't go. I want to see how you responded to people that were opposing you, how you responded to people that were that were reaching for you. I want to read everything about you, how you said it, when you said it, when you didn't say anything. I want to read. That's what I want to know. And so I read those four books with the intention of getting familiar with him. Let me encourage you to do that. If you don't know him, that's a great place to start. Listen to his voice. Watch what he does. And people say, well, I like to listen to Jesus. Well, what did he say? Well, I'm not sure. I've got a few scriptures that I really like. No, I'm talking about everything that he said. Not just in the Gospels, but all throughout his word. But he said, children, have you any meat? Remember, they didn't know who he was. Here you have somebody calling them. They were not children. He calls them children. Have you any meat? And they answered him, no. And he said unto them, cast the net on the right side of the ship and you shall find. They cast, therefore, think of this. They were fishing all night. A stranger walks up to them standing on the shore. He wasn't fishing. He was standing on the shoreline. And he said, hey, how things going? Yeah. Haven't caught anything. And one, many of the uh, commentators said he really said it in a negative tone. Haven't caught anything, have you? It wasn't just a question. It was almost a statement. I know you haven't caught anything. And he said, cast on the other side of the ship, on the right side of the ship. So they said, okay, why were they taking instruction from a stranger who's not fishing, who's standing on the shore? And now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. And in verse 7, it says, therefore... That disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, that's John. So John was watching what was happening. And he spoke to Peter. He said, it's him. So they didn't recognize him with the visual. But that person said, cast on the other side, on the right side. And the net was so full they couldn't even pull it into the boat. And John immediately goes, I recognize this. It's him. So John recognized it was Jesus based upon something that he did and followed up with the miraculous. But notice very quickly in in all of that, 
all of a sudden in the next in the next sentence now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord he girt his fishing his fisher's coat unto him for he was naked we know that he wasn't naked but he was not presentable uh, you know they said he was they were naked in the garden but they had fig leaves on so it wasn't complete but it was not it was it was immodest so it says for he was naked and he did cast himself into the sea so notice this John saw what he did and said and said it's him John saying that it's him alerted Peter and Peter said if you say it's him I believe it right. he puts on his cloak and he jumps into the water and he begins swimming to shore so you know he wasn't that they weren't they weren't like in the middle of the sea they were a hundred yards out you can swim a hundred yards especially if you're a fisherman so he's he's swimming to shore so John did it based on a miracle Peter did it based upon somebody else's word. There are times if you need, if you need a miracle, if you're not sure who Jesus is, Jesus will say something and follow it up with a miracle so that you can say, it's him. But Peter, we think Peter might have had less faith than John. But Peter, based upon somebody else's declaration, Peter's like, what was that, John? It's him? Well, hey, let's go. Peter, all Peter needed was for somebody in the vicinity to say, he's here. It said he began, he cast himself into the sea, and the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were 200 cubits. A cubit is about a foot and a half. Therefore, they were about 300 feet, which is 100 yards. Dragging the net with the fishes. As soon, as, as soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. Wait a minute, they were still dragging fish to the shore. This stranger standing on the shore already had fish, yeah. already had a fire started, yeah. <laughs> and he had bread. And the coals, I mean, he was ready for breakfast. Yeah. They were fishing all night, so it was breakfast time. So notice this, Peter was swimming to shore. There's so much, the Word of God, I hope you get excited about the Word of God, because yeah. I am. Amen. There's so much intricacy in the word. Remember, there was, a, there was a portion of scripture when Jesus was being tortured and Peter was standing far off and they said, aren't you, man, you got the same accent he's got. You sound like a gal. No, no, it's not me. No, I, I, no, I have no idea who he is. Oh, I saw you with him. You were... It was even Malchus. He said, you, I know it was you. And then he began to curse and swear that he didn't know him. And he was standing by a fire to warm himself. Here we got Peter swimming to Jesus. And he's thinking, let's, let's rewind the tape for a minute. I'm going to start a fire. Peter just is coming out of the water, cold. Needs to warm himself. Peter walks up to the fire you hungry? You mean you're even talking to me? I thought I denied you. And he's like, you hungry? Warm yourself. And then he goes, looks like you got a nice catch there, Peter. 153 or 156 fish. Two of the commentators made a comment about, about that. And they said, at that time, it was noted through history. Now, that's not the word of God. It was history that there were 153 species of fish. So Jesus was saying, I got it all covered. I got it all covered. I'm going to give you one of every kind of fish that's in the sea. That's possible because he can do anything. But Peter comes walking up to him and then Jesus looks at him and says, I know you denied me, but do you love me more than these? Remember, Peter said, I go fishing. Gives him a, a whole bunch of fish. And then he says, do you love me more than these? Jesus said unto them, 
Bring of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up, drew the net to the land full of great fishes, 150 and three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus said unto them, come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, who are you? So they got to shore, and at that point, nobody asked him who he was, knowing that it was the Lord. So we have nobody that knew it was him. Then we have John that knew it was him, based upon what he said and did a miracle. Then we have Peter finding out that it was him based upon John's word. Now we have the rest of the disciples that had came up. They had come to shore. They were standing around. And nobody then asked who it was because they knew who it was. There was another time when Jesus was standing there with bread and fishes. And he blessed and broke it and fed 20,000 people. Here Jesus is standing on the shoreline and he comes up and he's got bread and fish and he goes, you guys hungry? Remember this? See, Jesus, I'm trying to bring out a principle that Jesus portrayed or a characteristic. Do you know who I am? I'm not sure. All right, then I'll do a miracle for you. Is that what you need? Well, maybe. Do you need a miracle today? He may want to do one to prove to you who he really is. But you also may be standing next to somebody who just got a revelation. It's important today that John didn't just look and be like, I got a secret. What is it? I'm not going to tell you. I know who it is, but I'm not going to tell you. It's important that if you know who he is, that you open your mouth. That's good. Do you know how many times I have been in a Bible study and all of a sudden I'm teaching that precious bread of life, the word of God, and Jesus cut, pulls up a chair and sits next to me and it's like, wow, yeah. intense. And I'll look at them and I'll say, I feel him. He's right here. And all of a sudden, the person is like, I knew I felt something, but I didn't know what it There are times when we who know who he is need yes. to open up our voice Come and on, say, Lisa. it's him. Right. It's him. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Because you're opening your mouth. All of a sudden, Peter goes, woohoo, let's go. I want to get close to him. And Peter jumps out of the boat, yes. swims over to him. Your response about your interaction with Jesus could literally draw somebody else close to him. Yeah, nobody told me. God told me that. He said, we need to not just get close, but open your mouth and say, he's here. He's here. Right now he's here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm, come and dine. Then they all knew it was the Lord. Hallelujah. Then Jesus cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. First of all, Jesus created success from failure. What do you mean? They were fishing all night and they caught nothing. Have you ever had failure in your life? Even after you've met him? My God. Oh, as prophet would say, you're all sanctified. I've had failures. I've had failures after I met him. And it was important that Jesus comes into a situation in which I'm in the middle of, and he brings success out of failure. He says, I know you messed it up. I know you can't do this on your own, but just let me take care of this for you. Cast your net on the other side. He wants to do that. Why? To show how powerful he is? No. To have a relationship with you. You don't recognize him. He's trying to work in your situation. And he's like, I know what you need. Put your net on the other side. Lots of fish. John goes, ha! 
It's him. See, that's what he wanted. He didn't want to say, whoa, you're really awesome. He's like, it's him. It's him. He wants to know that he, that you know he wants to be involved in your circumstance. He wants you to know it's him. John picked up on that principle. And so the words and the results convinced John. But Peter, all Peter needed was somebody else in the vicinity to say, He's here. He's here. There are people that if they said he's here, I wouldn't believe them. But there are others that I know have a walk with God. And when they say he's here, I'm like, man, let's be, woo, let's go. Let's dive into the presence of God. Matthew 14, 26. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. So they're, they're in the sea, on the sea. Jesus comes up to them walking on the water. They were troubled, saying, It's a spirit. So where are we again? They don't know who it is. Here they are again. Didn't recognize it. But straightway, Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. So Jesus is in the midst of a miracle, in the midst of a storm. You got a storm going on? There are times when circumstances cause physical, emotional, health, storms, spiritual storms in our life. Problem is, is we're so focused on the storm that when Jesus starts to make his move towards us, instead of giving us comfort, it gives us fear. Because we didn't recognize him. How many times has Jesus made himself available Within earshot, he said, be of good cheer, and they heard him. He was probably within 50 yards. And they didn't recognize him at that close juncture. They were afraid. If you don't know it's him, you could be afraid. But what did he do? He opened up his mouth. Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. And Peter, notice the next verse, Peter answered him and said, Lord, the minute Jesus opened his voice, opened up his mouth and spoke, Peter said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come. He called him Lord. In the midst of your storm, when things are breaking up on you, and Jesus comes close, he may know that all you need is to hear his voice. It may come through a, a preached word. It may come through some, to one of your friends. They may say, man, the Lord just gave me a scripture. And you go, it's him. It's him. Notice a simple word from Jesus. And he said, hey, I'll walk on water too. A simple word. It's I, be not afraid. Hey, I'm willing to get involved in a miracle. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you realize how powerful a simple word? Jesus didn't say, hey, it's me. Come on out and walk with me. He said, it's me. Don't be afraid. And Peter said, I got it. If, if, if it's you, miracles are That's possible good. right yeah. now. Yes. He went from fearful to faithful in right. one, my God, in <laughs> one <laughs> sentence. I'm willing to walk on water if it's you. You may not know it's him, but if you'll keep listening, he'll say, be of good cheer. It's me. It's me. Don't be afraid. Hallelujah. They heard his voice. What do you need? What do you need this morning? In Matthew chapter 11, verse 3, it says, and said unto him, this is John the Baptist, 
He's in prison waiting to be beheaded. Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. John the Baptist was in prison, most likely never getting out. In the middle of all of that, almost like a storm. Hey, that guy that I've been walking with the last six months, I'm related to. Is he the Messiah? Have you ever had a question? Is all of this necessary? Can I get to heaven without any of this? Is it really him? Does it matter whether he's one or three or a thousand? Does, it, does baptism really matter? Does the method matter? Does, right. does the name that's called over us in baptism actually matter? Does any of this New Testament, have you ever asked a question? John is asking a question. Is it really him? And Jesus' answer was, sometimes we need to be reminded of prophecy. When he comes, people, disabled people will jump like a deer. The blind shall see, the deaf shall hear, and the dead shall be raised. See, Jesus simply reminded them of prophecy. Sometimes we have a question. Things may not be going our way. What, I, I, all I've done is the right thing, and here I am sitting in prison. And it looks like they're licking their chops, the guy who's got the sharp sword in his hand. Sometimes we need to be reminded of prophecy. Sometimes we need to be reminded of promises that have been made through the Word of God and also through the preached Word of God and also from the Spirit of God. But we also need to be reminded of things in times past, which says they overcame by the testimony and the blood of the Lamb. So there are times when we can be in the middle of a storm and somebody needs to hear your testimony. John was saying, is it really the Messiah? He said, tell him, the lame are walking, the blind are seeing, the deaf are hearing, and the dead are being raised. Your testimony can literally lift somebody up out of a doubtful rut and give them hope again. All because he wasn't sure who Jesus was. He was in prison because he told people that he was the Messiah. So in one instance, he's proclaiming him as the Messiah. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. I think. You're not always on top of the world. John wasn't, but he needed to hear the testimony. Imagine when that guy came back and he said, well, I saw him, and here's what he said. The dead are being raised. That's right. That's right. That's prophecy. It is him. I don't remember anybody else ever <laughs> raising the dead and, and blind seeing and the lame walking and the... Ah, oh, yeah, that, the Messiah would do all of that. I remember Naaman, you know, there's a few. Elijah prophesied or the, the, the I'm sorry, Ezekiel prophesied over the dead bones and they all, go ahead, prophesy. Can they live? You know. What an answer. Thou knowest. What about Gamaliel in Acts chapter 5? They were talking about what to do about these Wild apostolics. Yeah. Yeah. We can't seem to shut them up. I mean, we beat them. We whip them. Throw them in jail. If we let them out, they start preaching. 
If we don't let them out, we find them on some hill outside of the prison preaching. We can't stop these people. And Gamaliel. Um, guys, let me talk to you for a second. Um, and now I say to you, refrain from these men. Just back off. Just leave them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, what he's saying is, you're not sure the source of these people's power. So what Gamaliel was saying, you don't know where they came from. You don't know what's going on here. He said, let me give you some wisdom here. If this is humanity working, it'll come to naught. Nothing will happen. This will just be a little flash in the pan. But if it be of God, you can't stop them. Lest happily you be found to even fight against God. Is it him? You may be asking, God, are you involved in my life? I'm trying to commit to you and I'm trying to do things right, but man, it seems like some things are falling apart. Let me help you be rest assured that if it's of flesh, it will fail. But it sounded like God. He said, remember this guy? He rose up. He had over 400 followers. Remember this guy? He rose up for a long time. But it it absolutely came to nothing. What a great message for us today. If we're doing something in of humanity, it will fail. Gamaliel, who really was just trying to give people who were opposing Jesus, trying to give them some advice. If this is of humanity, don't worry about it. It's a flash in the pan. It'll be over with shortly. But if it's of God, nobody can stop it. Is it him? If not, it will fail. If it's of God, nothing can stop it. I hope you receive some confidence today that if what's happening can be found in the word and being directed of the spirit, you can't stop it. I can't stop it. The devil can't stop it. Don't be afraid of the devil. People say, oh, don't say that about the devil. He'll come and kill you. If he, if he could kill you, you'd already be dead. Why would he wait? You get baptized. And, even when you're thinking about coming to this church, he'd kill you. Then you sit there and you think, I think I might be baptized in Jesus' name. He would kill you. And then you say, Lord, I want to be filled with your spirit. He would kill you. But even after the birth, when you say, you know, I think I want to be used of God. I think I want God. He would wipe you out. That's right. You can't touch us. If this be of God, you can't stop it. No matter what you do, you can't stop it. Nobody. Romans 8, 38. For I am persuaded, said Paul. That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can stop us. Notice how he said, nor any other creature. He talked about things. The only thing that can stop you is you. That's it. We heard about it Wednesday night. It's right here. You make a decision. Gamaliel was saying, just back off. Give it a little bit of time and the proof will be there. Maybe what you need is the test of time. Yes, yes, that's good. That's good. Let me reassure you. Yeah. We, we just had our 30th anniversary. I don't know how much time you're waiting on, but we're the same as we were 30 years ago. Yeah. We teach the same stuff. We believe in the Bible the same way. We expect the same results as we've always expected. We've never changed. The problem that you're experiencing is the world around you, including churches, 
are becoming more and more corrupt. So it makes us look more conservative. We're preaching the same thing. We believe the same thing. We have not become more conservative. We are simply doing the same thing over and over again. I can say that, and you can say, yeah, but we don't know what you preached. Look it up. Look up online. Look up all... We used to have tapes up there. Some of them are on the, uh, on the computer, recorded up there. You can see it's the same thing. We preach the same thing over and over again. There are some things when actually I had dark hair. I had dark hair, and I was preaching on holiness. It's the same thing over and over and over again. It never changes. This never changes, ever. Praise God. If you need the test of time, just hang on. Sooner or later, you're going to say, you know, I think these guys are going to keep doing this. You know, I I don't think they're going to change. Thomas in John chapter 20, verse 25. The other disciples therefore said unto him, we have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, except I shall see. Here's what I need. This is what Thomas was saying. They were saying, hey, he's resurrected. Yeah, I don't believe it. Oh, we saw him. Yeah, no, unless I, unless I, unless I shall see his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side. It's pretty gross. I will not believe. And after eight days again, wow. Did you realize eight days is the, time that they actually brought a child to the temple to be circumcised and give him a name and it was after eight days is when Jesus showed up to prove (laughs) that he was born from the dead okay we'll just keep going that was just free after eight days again his disciples were within and Thomas with them then came Jesus the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said peace unto you then saith he to Thomas Reach hither thy finger. Huh? He just walks through the door, through the walls and says, hey, peace. I don't know about you. I wouldn't have a whole lot of peace about it. Imagine there was somebody standing by a wall. And all of a sudden, "Ah, don't do that to me. He shows up and says, peace. Then said he to Thomas, okay, reach your finger and behold my hands and Here's my side, and thrust into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Thomas is looking, Thomas is talking to Jesus. And he uses the Greek words kyrios and Christos, which means my earthly Lord and my heavenly Lord, my heavenly God. He said, you are not only my earthly Lord, but you are my heavenly God. You are my Lord and my God. And notice this, Thomas answered, my Lord and my God. Thomas, Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Okay, what happened here? Thomas said, I want to put my finger through the hole in his hands and I want to thrust my hand into his side. And Jesus shows up and says, hi, Thomas. How you doing? Here you go. And Thomas goes, don't need it. We're good. What am I saying? There are things that we say we need from him. But he really didn't. I won't believe unless. Oh, you've said it. It's about time God does this and God does that. You say that. But if Jesus walked through that wall right now and said, Hey, Michael, you'd be like, whatever. (laughs) Whatever. You know he would. He'd be like, I'm in. (laughs) Whatever. What you think you need. It's not really what you need. All you need for him is to come to you into a circumstance in which you are fearful. They were hiding in that upper room because they were afraid. That They were afraid for their lives. And Jesus walks up there and goes, Hi, you said you needed this. Do you need it? Nah, nah, we're good. We're good. I'm willing to die for you now. 
what we think we need. He was willing to give it to him. Go ahead. That's how desperate he is for you to know him. Every one of these circumstances, there were countless others, but every one of these circumstances, while we were having worship, I didn't know this, but, but the thought came into my head, so obvious it was him because it was true. He said, by the way, all those circumstances were, they were not good circumstances. They were all situations in which failure, fear, situation, sickness, all this stuff, all these, they were all bad situations. And that's why during the song, I picked up my, I picked this up and I looked at it and I'm like, um, wow, you're right. They didn't know who he was. Fishing all night, didn't have any food. You look, bring the fish. And then you have the disciples saw him walking on the sea. There was a storm and they were fearful. It was bad situation. You've got our, he, John the Baptist is in prison, ready to lose his life. Not a good situation. Then you've got Thomas, who is in the upper room. He's in the room with them, and he's afraid for his life, and he doesn't believe for sure that Jesus is resurrected, and he shows up. Every one of these situations had a bunch of doubt, failure, unbelief, fear. And Jesus says, I know why. You don't know who I am. You're not sure. And he shows up and he says, Miguel, what do you need? Go ahead. I'll do whatever you need. Peter, if it's you, let me walk on the water. Of course. Peter, if that's what you need, come on out. He is so desperate for you to know who he is. Why? Because your storm will go away when you realize that Jesus is literally walking on top of that storm. When he comes in and says, I can, I'm the one that causes all this stuff. Philip in John 14, he said, if you had known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth, from this point forward, you know him, notice this, and have seen him. Anybody ever see a spirit? God is, John 4, 24, God is a spirit. Anybody ever see a spirit? A spirit hath not flesh and bone, flesh and blood, doesn't have it. You can see its effects, but you can't see it. Jesus' words, so it can't be a lie, he said, from this point, you know him, and you've seen him. <laughs> Philip, he's like, I'm not... Should I, should I act stupid? What are you talking about? That's what he said. He said, Lord, think of what he said. Show us the... Jesus just told him, you've seen him. And he says, show him... Would you show us the... You've already seen him. If you'll just show us the Father, it will satisfy me, Philip said, or satisfy us. And then Jesus said, have I been so long time with you? And yet, hast thou not known me, Philip? Yet he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. So how can you possibly say, show me the Father? Yeah. You just looked at him. You're looking at him right now. Hello, I'm in here. That's what he was saying. Philip, look at all the things that Philip did in the book of Acts, brought revival. If we want to know the Father, notice what he said here. If we want to know the Father, we have to get to know him, yes. Jesus. Yes. He said, if you know me, you know him. Right. He said, you don't know him because you don't know me. Right. And he said, if you've seen me, you've seen him. He linked it. He said, it's not possible to know him and not know me or to know me and not know him. Because right. when you get one, you get the other. It's a, it's a, it's a group package here. Yeah. 
There's a spirit and there's a body. And Jesus said, right now, I'm the spirit and I'm living in this body. You get both right now, knowing me. If we want to see the Father, anybody want to see him? We have to see him. We have to see Jesus if we want to see the Father. The Bible says that first Jesus appeared to Cleopas and one of the other disciples, but their eyes were holding. These are the two men that were walking on the road to the Emmaus. And it said he was walking with them. They were walking to Emmaus, and Jesus just kind of slips up next to them. Hey, guys, what's going on? Haven't you heard? Man, there's all sorts of stuff going on in Jerusalem. Man, this guy, Jesus, the Messiah, man, he, he, they put him on a cross. and my, Some people are saying he's resurrected from the dead. And all this stuff, and Jesus is walking with him. Wouldn't you like to have been him? Just, no kidding. He was a handsome guy, wasn't he? <laughs> he really wasn't. But they get to the house that Jesus keeps walking, and they said, Hey, why don't you come in and eat with us? Nah, I'm just going to... No, no, they compelled him to come in. So he came in, sitting at the table, and he grabs the bread, and he breaks it, and he blesses it. And they go, it's him! Then he's gone. What happened? They didn't know who he was until he did something that he had done before. With the loaves and the fishes, it uses the same words. The lad brought his lunch, and it says, he blessed, and he broke it, and he fed 20,000. Here he's sitting there just with those two that I know of, and he blessed, and he broke it. And they go, it's him. Things may not have gone the way you thought they would, but as you're Moving on with your life, walking on the road to, the, to Emmaus, Jesus slips up with you and he starts talking with you about it. Man, I don't know. They said he was raised from the dead. But well, do you believe it? Man. And all of a sudden he goes, watch this. I'm going to bless it. Bless this food which we are about to partake of. Yeah. He blessed and broke it. And they go, oh, it's him. What does Jesus need to do in your life that he's already done before? To show you that even if you have a doubt, he's willing to slip up next to you. And just walk with you. Hey. Yeah. Talk with you. Interact with you. You mean he cares about two? No. He cares about one. A woman at a well. Doesn't matter who you are. She knew that the Jews would have nothing to do with her. So what does he do? He walks up and says, hey, how about a drink? Yeah. She's like, you're breaking the rules. I'm just trying to get your attention. Yeah. I'm trying to get your attention. See, everybody's got this figured out wrong. I'm the Messiah. I love everybody. Yeah. I don't care what culture, color. I don't care what religion you're from. It doesn't, I love y'all. And I'm going to minister to all of you. That's him. Whatever you need. What she needed was somebody to come up to her, not only ask for a drink and say, I'm the same as you, but to start to prophesy to her and say, I know who you are. I know the sin that you've lived in and the sin that you're living in now, and I'm still asking you for a drink. Right. Because I love you in spite of who you are and what you've done. John 20, and I'm closing. John 20, 13. This is... After the resurrection, in the Amplified, verse 13, and they said to her, Woman, why are you sobbing? The angels did. She told them, Because they've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. This is Mary. On saying this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't know recognize him what he's talking it was Jesus and Jesus in verse 15 he said to her woman why are you so crying 
For whom are you looking? Supposing that it was the gardener, she replied, so remember, now she's talking with angels, <laughs> having a conversation with a couple angels. Hey, what seems to be the problem? Well, you know, I'm, my Lord was crucified and I don't, I don't know where the body is. I would like that to happen someday. Then Jesus himself shows up. Ma'am, you look troubled. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're the guy that took him, then if you carried him away from here, please tell me where you put him. And I'll go get him. And I'll take care of him. Because he's supposed to be right here. In verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary. He was already talking to her. What seems to be the problem? Well, I can't find my crucified Christ. I can't find him. He said, Mary. She turned around and said, Rabboni, which means teacher or master. She said, See, circumstance may require more than an angel. It may even require more than him talking to you. He may have to say, Douglas, it's you. That told me two things. First of all, he knows your name. You're not just somebody in the midst of nine billion people. She was alone. He walks up and he says, you look troubled. Yeah. Douglas, it's you. You need to know that he cares enough to meet you alone. But he also knows your name. And he's willing to speak your name. Would you stand with me? I felt all through this message, I feel like it was hitting on almost every circumstance that's here. My flesh wanted to stop and say there's somebody here that feels like a failure because you knew him and you went back to what you usually do and he showed up and you didn't recognize him I wanted to stop right there <sighs> elder I wanted to say there's somebody you used to know him you need to come to this altar right now. But he said, no. Because I want to make sure I talk to every person. Because there's other people that have different problems. There's reasons why they don't recognize him. Because of things that they denied him. There are things that they would recognize if I just simply did what I used to do. If I opened up my mouth and spoke their name. But since I covered all of these, he is absolutely like a wave. He's covered every one of us, including me. And he's saying, I know what you need. And I'm right here. And if you'll take a step toward me, I'll begin revealing myself to you. And you'll say, it's you. You came. You came here for me. You cared enough about me to show up in this place. I needed you. And you talked to that preacher about me. And you knew exactly what I needed. How can I walk out of here and say, Lord, you don't care. When he literally is reaching for every one of us. He's drawing you. He's drawing you.
Can you hear your name? Can you smell the fish cooking over the fire where you denied him? Are you in your own little prison and you forgot about all the miracles he did? Do you need a testimony? Look at the person standing or kneeling next to you. They're a testimony. You know their life. You know that they were a sinner. You know that they were addicted. You know that they were lost and angry. You know who they were. And yet here they are praying and lifting up their hands and weeping before the Lord. None of us are exempt from this. Jesus, come and talk to him. Come and talk to him. God, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I need to know you. I don't want to know just about you. I don't want to be preached to. I don't want to read about it. I don't want to just hear it. I want to say, it's him. It's him. Before I go. He's standing at the shoreline. here this morning. He's reaching for us. He's saying, you need to know me. But you think I'm making it difficult and I'm not. I'm doing everything I can do so that you can know me. I'm making it easy for you. heart and begin to repent. Open your heart and begin to worship. This is more than a denomination. It's not a denomination. It's not religion. It's knowing. It's relationship. He's constantly reaching and pulling. He's constantly speaking your name. He's drawing you about what you do only. It's about do you know him? Are you willing to open your heart to him? Are you willing to submit to him? Are you willing? Are you willing to fall upon the rock and be broken? Oh, I don't want to be familiar with you just in services. I want to know who you are from a distance. Jesus. Oh, Not just when the music's playing. Not just when we're sitting with you at dinner. Not just when you're healing the sick and opening the eyes of the blind. Not just when you're doing the Sermon on the Mount. God, when I can't quite make you out, Lord. When I can't quite identify you from a distance. I want to be familiar with you. It's him. It's him. He's here right now. Come on, let him. Are you hungry? Let him feed you. The fire's already hot. The fish are ready to eat. He's already got something to feed you. Oh, hallelujah. Testimony. Your circumstance is not new. There's multiple testimonies of everything that you've gone through and going through.
I give my tomorrows to you. God, I give my voice to you. I give my tears to you, Lord. I give my abilities to you. I give my experiences to you, God. Hallelujah. I give you all my knowledge. I give you any wisdom that you might have dished out to me, God. I give it to you. I give it to you as an offering. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, that's it. Let him. He's reaching. He's reaching. He's speaking. He's showing. He's reminding. He's acting. He's doing everything that we need to prove to us that he's here. Oh. He spoke so that they would believe he raised Lazarus from the dead. Everything he did. I don't need to do this, but so that they might hear me say, raise him from the dead. It's all for us so that we'll believe it's him. Lord, you're bigger than my mountain. You're more powerful than my sickness. You're greater than any opposition. Yes. <laughs> Come on. You are greater than my fears. Come on, right now. Greater. Hallelujah. God, you're greater. Greater than my sins, Lord. Your blood is more powerful than every sin. Come on, that's it. If you don't know what to do. I ask you today. If you're not sure if you know him, the best way is to simply apologize. Lord, there's a lot of things I've done in my life that I know is sin. And I'm asking you, please forgive me. It's my fault. I'm not going to go through this life blaming everybody else. I did things. Yeah, other people have done, but God, I did too. It's my fault. Please forgive me. Come on. That's what you, if you'll do that, you'll feel his presence start to get really close to you. It's what he wants. Your apology makes it possible for him to come close. When he comes close, you'll feel his power. Your faith will start to rise. You'll start to feel his awesome love. Then you can open your hands up and reach for him and say, Lord, I give you permission to come close. That power will begin to fall upon you. Like an awesome anointing, you'll feel his tremendous infinite power your faith in him will begin to rise he can fix my problems he can do it he can do it in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus come on yes he can just let him just let him Come on, that's it. Some of you need him desperately. God's been speaking to you specifically. I'm in the middle of a storm. <laughs> and I'm full of fear, God. Be of good cheer. 
it is I. Be not afraid. Woo. Someone needed to hear that today. I'm right here. And because I'm here, you don't need to be afraid. Oh, God. Come on, that's it. Right now. It's you. It's you. And I don't need to be afraid. Oh, I don't need to be afraid. Come on, everybody. Perfect love casts out fear. Let your glory fill this house. And that fear and doubt will have to be removed, God. Come on. Come on, renew it. Revive it right now. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. name of Jesus. It is I, be not afraid. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, your disciples prayed and they could not get the miracle. Oh, ye of little faith, you said to the disciples. <laughs> you showed up. The disciples couldn't do it. You showed up. God, this man's been prayed for. Your disciples have prayed. And now it's time for you to show up, God. Show up for your servant today. In the name of Jesus. Come on. <laughs> Come on. That's it. You'll never earn it. You don't earn this. You simply believe. Oh. Only believe, he said. Believe him. Come on, if you can feel him. It's easy to believe him. That's it, Chris. You feel him. Now believe him. But God, I haven't done this and I have. All you got to do is believe for a miracle. Oh, yes. We have to obey to get to heaven, but we only need to believe for a miracle. Oh, yes. I need a miracle. I need a miracle. Oh, yeah,
prodigal started walking home and the Bible says when he was a long way off the father recognized him all you got to do is make a move and he'll come running you may not be able to see him but he can see you oh yes just make a move Lord I feel like I'm a long ways away he'll come running he'll come running Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah.